But what would this look like? Well, if it is true that God is all knowing, and it is true that God is all loving, then evil might exist in the world because God doesn't actually have the power to prevent it from happening. One of the arguments is to say, well, God doesn't have the power because his power will not allow him to interfere with free will. Well, if he doesn't have the power to interfere with free will, then arguably, at least logically, he's not all powerful, right? There are constraints on his power. One example being he does not have the power to force us to do it, right? He allows us to make our own choices. Therefore, he does not have the power to, you know, to persuade us or to force us to make a change. Having that inability is something beyond his power. Therefore, God is not all powerful, right? So if we say that God actually isn't all powerful, it's a misnomer to talk about God as having all power. Another example um, is to say that God might never sin, right? That's a power he doesn't have. He doesn't have the power to sin. Okay, well, if God doesn't have the power to sin, and some people might say desire, um, then fine. Um, a classic um, philosophical argument is to say, um, does God have the ability to move a rock that he cannot create? So can God create a rock, right? Can he create this rock? Actually, I take that back. I messed it up. Can God create a rock? Can he bring a rock into existence that he cannot move? Can God create a rock that he cannot move? If he can create the rock, then it, it expresses his power, right? His power is expressed in his act of creation. But by definition, if we say, can he create a rock that he cannot move, his inability to move it then becomes a limitation on his power. He can create it, but it can't be moved. Therefore, it's a limitation on his power. This is, a, this is more of a sort of a, don't let it boggle your mind, it's more of a conceptual tool to show that um, it's at least conceivable, arguably, that there might be limitations on his power, his inability to uh, force our will because he has imbued us with free will, um, the concept that um, God cannot sin is another, and then sort of like this argument that can God create this rock that he cannot move, all of these are attempts to show that, well, if there's a limitation on his power, it makes sense why evil exists, right? He definitely knows that it exists, and he loves us, but he just can't prevent it because there's a limitation on his power. He's not all powerful. Okay. Next one. What if one and three are true and two is false? What if God is all powerful and God is also all loving? Um, however, he's not all knowing. He doesn't know that evil exists, right? Well, what would that claim look like? Well, if someone knew that evil exists, they'd certainly stop. they certainly prevent evil occurrence from happening. So if I, I knew that someone were being tortured um, and, I, and, I, and I cared for the person, I loved the person, there was no question about that, and I had the power to prevent um, this person from being, being tortured, you know, I could use force to stop the torturer from torturing uh, the victim, well, I'd certainly do that. However, I don't know that someone's being tortured, right? I don't know that something's happening. I don't know that evil's occurring. So my inability to know, my lack of information, can't motivate anything. I don't know that it's happening. So, you know, evil occurs. So that's another stance, right? It's, it's not the case that God doesn't love us. It's not the case that God doesn't have the power. He just doesn't know that it's occurring. Um, for religious believers, this is a little less accepting. It's, it's a harder pill to swallow to say that God uh, has a limitation on his knowledge than it is to say that God has a limitation of his power. So this, this first stance, uh, to say that God's power is limited in some way, most people of religious belief can sort of work their way through that understanding and say, you know, I, I can see how God might, power might be limited for the three or four examples that I've given. It's a little bit more difficult to say that God doesn't have the knowledge because we think of um, God in a secular or a religious sense, just people's understanding of God, they um, understand God to be all-knowing. How could evil exist without knowledge? Very simple. If he doesn't know it's occurring, he can't prevent it from happening. And then the last, which is by far the most, um, the most difficult 
to digest, the most difficult to um, believe for those of religious faith, is the claim that God doesn't love you, right? If it's the case that God's love is false, then he doesn't care. He has the power to stop, and he knows that it's occurring. It's right there in front of him. Um, if I see something, and I know that it's occurring, and I also know that it's causing incredible amounts of pain and suffering to an individual, um, and I have the power to prevent that from occurring, however, it occurs anyway, right? No one's saying that evil doesn't exist. We know that evil exists. Well, if that's the case, then it's because he doesn't love us. And that's the worst claim, right? That's the worst claim. It's that God sort of created the world, put everything into motion, and then sort of like a, a, a father who bastardized uh, his children, he just sort of walked away and was like, well, you know, I don't really care if they live or die. I don't really care what happens to them. It's my creation. I'm gone. That's, a, that's hard for um, religious believers um, to swallow. Um, and, and I think, technically speaking, no religious believer is going to accept three, right? Um, and if three is actually accepted, if people believe this to be the case, they usually walk away from their religious faith. Um, why? Well, there is the power to stop it, and there's knowledge that is happening, but it still exists, and the reason why it exists is because he doesn't love you, he doesn't really care. Um, there's a technical term um, associated with uh, this last claim, and that is known as absentee deism. Absentee deism. It's like, like a, um, an absent father, right? An absentee deist. He creates stuff, he has the power to get everything into motion, the universe comes into existence, but then he just lets things occur the way they, they will, and he won't interfere, though he has the power and he has the knowledge. Again, as I said, this is the most difficult um, for those of religious faith to accept. This is a little bit more, a little, a little bit less difficult for those to accept, and this is the least difficult to accept. So, uh, it's important then, and the reason why I bring up this discussion uh, is not to get into a big heated religious debate, that's definitely not my intention. It is more to discuss the application and the use of a truth table in an example that I think um, sort of rings, has a tone uh, across religious beliefs, across religious um, faiths, across cultures, um, and hopefully thereby making the idea of truth tables and logic and um, uh, statement logic uh, more accessible and more appealing to viewers who otherwise wouldn't be interested in, in the stuff. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do with, um, with uh, truth tables. There's a lot of cool things you can do with symbolic logic. Um, I hope this uh, video has been informative. I hope you've learned something new. Uh, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to sit here and let me uh, uh, share my ideas with you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Goodbye.